Welcome to another episode in Fill Your Boots, the FIL podcast series. I'm Colin May, uh, Global Hygiene Support Specialist for GEA, and today I've got with me Natasha McGuire from Farm Medics. We want to talk a little bit about the best drying off practices towards the end of the season. We're getting very close to that at the moment, and there's a few things we can do that can really improve the end of season and help us with the beginning of the season. Drying off's coming up, Natasha, and at this time of year, I always find most farmers are just going, yeehaw, we're out of here, it's shut down, close off. But realistically, it's very, very important to set it up for next season. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Colin. And I think one of the things that people forget is that what happens at the end of the season really impacts what happens at the beginning of the next season. So it's not just a matter of blanket dry cowing any longer. (laughs) We're going to be limited with that. We're... Like yeah, there's a worldwide focus on reducing um, uh, the use of blanket or let's say uh, unnecessary antibiotic use, um, and blanket dry cow really falls into that. And I think it's interesting to see the history of where where that process came from, and and, and why it came about. Because at the time that was quite valid, but it's it's becoming less relevant now. Do you think there's a dependency on that? You know, I, I have farmers say to me, "Oh, I've got a dry cow. I'm putting the cows up in a crop." I just want that peace of mind gone. Do we really need to put antibiotic into young cows with cell count of less than 10, 12,000? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think the answer uh, from pretty much everyone would be no. Um, you know, putting them onto crop, um, you know, that's a whole different set of circumstances. I think, you know, the more we learn about um, how we're going to find ways to reduce antibiotic use, the more we have to realize that we've got to. Have conditions a little bit better where we keep our cows, um, and certainly, you know, blanket dry cow and then putting cows on crop in the spring is not necessarily going to protect them anyway. So the the blanket dry cow obviously has a an effect over time, and it's something that doesn't last forever. I think sometimes people think it even lasts into lactation, so that you're getting some sort of beneficial effect after, and that cannot possibly be be the case because we're we're selling the milk and it's not full of antibiotics, so it's it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> You would soon light up the residue tests with any of the dairy companies in New Zealand if there was antibiotic left in there. So, so that I do strike that at times. Mm -hmm. Farmers believe there's a carryover antibiotic in the udder. That's not the case. That's not the case, and I think we have to remember too. It's not just about the actual dry off. Like we don't say, okay, on you know two weeks time we're going to dry the cows off. We need to start preparing much earlier than that for dry off, and and that goes right back to. Um, what I was saying, like we, what happens at the end of the season um, and towards the end of the season, really that sort of six weeks, eight weeks out from the end of the season, we want to be focusing on getting ready to dry off. So that focus is going to be mainly around, um, from my point of view, teak condition um, because we need to get that as good as we can get. And, and right now coming towards where the cows are producing less milk, there's um, huge risk around overmilking. And basically, we, we can cause a lot of teat damage at the end of the season. So getting prepared and being switched on about drying off, thinking about it long before we actually need to do the procedure, we'll see a better result all around. So you talk about teat condition. So we, we need to improve teat condition. What are some of the key actions we need to do to improve that teat condition in the last six weeks, month of dry off? Okay. So a lot of people um, will be sort of taking care of this anyway like um i guess those that move to once a day you've got less stress on the cow she's producing less milk um so having the cups on for uh, particularly in a herringbone shed or a shed without automatic cup removers or automatic takeoffs if the cow has finished milking out we get very high vacuum at the teat end and basically what we're doing is pulling that teat sphincter out through the bottom of the teat obviously causing um damage to the ring and and, uh, hyperkeratosis those you know, deteriorations in the teat condition will mean the cow is less resistant to mastitis infections. Um, but also it means that because that skin is so rough, we've got more opportunity for the dirt and the mud and the manure and the things that she's going to face when she gets onto the crop or in the spring or when she's calving to cause mastitis next season. So while that might sound like a long time away, calving's a long time away, Actually, um, you know, the things that we're doing now will impact how smoothly that process goes. Right. So tea condition is important. What are some of the other things you've, you've talked about? Over milking, 
what else is there that farmers should really look at towards dry off? Um, so as well, lo- looking at their, um, I guess their teat hygiene, uh, like whatever they're doing with, with regard to teat spraying. So teat spraying's got two um, important things post milking. One is that you're killing pathogens that might be remaining from the cow before or that are involved in the milk harvesting process. Um, and the second, like, so there's not a big pathogen challenge when the weather's better, right? So now yeah. we're seeing good weather conditions. Um, so there's less of that challenge. So the temptation is to, you know, dilute the teat spray so that, that you know, they don't need that, that efficacy anymore. Um, but the risk, of course, is usually the teat spray's also got not just the disinfectant in it for killing the pathogens that the cow might face, but also the emollients to condition the teat. So um, in the in the uh, summertime, we also get quite a quite a bit of wind and quite a bit of sun. So you've got the teats uh, potentially being quite dry, and um, the emollients just like moisturizer. It keeps that skin integrity, which means once again that we're going to have better conditioned teats coming into spring. So that's another really serious aspect to teat condition. So really, we should be running the emollient at say 12 percent, maybe up to fifteen percent in that last three four weeks of dry off, because that will also give some suppleness to the teats, means that insertion of teat seal in antibiotic should be more comfortable for the cow mm-hmm. also, and the milking of the cow. Obviously. Definitely. Um, uh, yeah, the, the better the condition of the teats, the better everything's going to be. So an important step in the dry cow process, um, whether you're using, when I say dry cow, I don't mean necessarily administration of antibiotics, but drying the cows off. Um, obviously, you're going to have a, most people will be using some sort of um, sealant or dry cow therapy on some of the cows at least. So anything that we're inserting into a teat end, we're going to have to clean the teat before we do that. So just in the same way with an intramammary infusion, if we're giving the cow an antibiotic treatment or anything that we do with the teats, if we're putting something into the end of the teat, we run the risk of pushing something from outside up there. Now, if our teats are in terrible dry condition, if we've got damaged teat ends from overmilking, if we've got um, any situation like that, then when we come to actually do that alcohol wipe of the teat end, it becomes impossible to clean. So our risk of pushing something on the, up there is, is very, very high. And, um, you know, that, that can be really unfortunate for the cow. Like a lot of the time, you know, it might mean that you have to shoot a cow because of something that we did when we were drying her off. So it's an interesting one, and we talk, talked about this in, in the first series, but, you know, Poor practices. You, what have you seen the consequences of this? I know yeast, which for me was just an eye opener. I'd never heard of yeast, but I, I remember you saying that probably <laughs> came from the insertion of dry cow. Yes, and, and so I think it's important to remember. Um, often people think because they're using an antibiotic, let's say if they're going to do blanket dry cow, or if they're using selective dry cow, if they're using an antibiotic, they don't have to clean anything because the antibiotic is going to take care of everything. There are some bugs that just don't respond to antibiotics. So I think from our point of view... Um, well, yeast is fed by antibiotics. Well, yeast, fungi make antibiotics, actually. So yeah. there's, they just laugh in the face of an antibiotic that's administered. So I think it's really important that um, there are some bugs that just don't respond um, to antibiotics. And, and things that come off our skin or, you know, if we're not wearing gloves, if we're dirty, if we've got buckets of water and, and we're not absolutely fastidious about hygiene, we can have an absolute disaster. And that's with or without blanket dry cow. Like, I think people have got the idea that problems only come if you're not using an antibiotic for all the cows. The problems actually come from poor technique. Yeah. So we can teat seal confidently if we know the status of the cows before we're teat sealing, if we know um, pathogen status of the herd, like what, you know, there's, there's all sorts of things to consider, but we can confidently do that if we're fastidious with our hygiene. So trying to dry cow the herd before breakfast in most cases isn't recommended. <laughs> That's always my great yeah. It's a great comparison. Anybody who's got you know sort of four hundred cows that wants to dry off the whole herd before they eat breakfast, you are asking for trouble because every cow it's not just one cow. Every cow's got four teats, right? Yeah. So if you've got four cows, you've got sixteen hundred teats, and that's a lot of teats to have to wipe. And can your hand on heart say the first one you did was the same as the last one? Yeah, yeah. When you're hungry, it, I know what I'm like when I'm hungry, Colin. So it's not not a good not a good what, thing. What about these buckets of hot water I see sitting in the pit with a dry cow in there just to warm it up, make it flow? You definitely hot water makes the the teat sealants and and the things flow, but um, unfortunately, hot water can be a great carrier of terrible things. So 
I think um, most people realise now that if you put your tubes into the hot water, you're really going to ask for problems. So what they recommend is to keep the the, um, the teat seal uh, bucket and actually have the tubes put that whole bucket into a bucket of hot water. So it's you know you're not going to actually get contact of any water with the tubes themselves. I've seen some of those buckets sometimes, and the water's not that clear at the uh, no. halfway through the stage. <laughs> so. There's been a bit of fecal matter <clears throat> yeah. moved into there. And, and certainly, um, like we've, we, I mean, everybody's probably heard horror stories of people that have, you know, administered whether it's dry cow or teat sealants, and they've had cows die afterwards. And yeah, I, I'm sure everyone's heard a story about it that happens. Uh, you know, we came across a problem um, a few weeks ago high cell count, farm grading. I think we've got to be very careful around transitioning herds from uh, spring calving to winter calving. Like in this instance, we saw cows that had had long lactation. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that also becomes an issue. I guess it depends on how much milk they're producing. So yeah. um, in some sheds, you know, if they've got automatic cup removers once again, um, you know, if they're programmed well and, and they're working well, uh, when the flow drops, those cups will come off. But in other sheds where the cups are maybe on for as long as it takes to get around the rotary to the cups off or yeah. uh, to the, you know, the person coming back at the hearing bone, the cups may have been on, you know, let's imagine the milking time was only one minute. The cow might be producing hardly anything. And if those cups are staying on for seven minutes with no yeah. milk flow, there's a really high vacuum at the teat end. So once again, that overmilking is a huge, huge issue when it comes to drying off. So when we're coming to drawing off, should really be watching that milk blow volume and ca- cows that are getting light probably should be dried off. I would say, like, while it's tempting to sort of wait until a certain deadline, um, maybe we need to get our heads around doing it more gradually. And those cows that have got low milk flow, maybe heifers that have got staph aureus, um, you know, that they'd be dried off early so they're given the best chance of um, having a good rest, getting uh, good condition back on them for ones that are a bit skinny and things like that. Yeah. And, um, you know, sort of making things a little bit easier all around for everyone. So, Natasha, you talk about um, the use of dry cow and how that's evolved in time. You know, if we go back, uh, somatic cell counting and through the dairy company started from memory in about 1992 93 season. Now, I think the limit was about 450 at the time. You know, that, that started the drive of dry cow. You know, what, what have we. What have we seen from there, a reliance on that? Yeah, it's an interesting story. Um, I think somatic cell counts used to be really high. Like it wasn't uncommon for herds to have somatic cell counts of over 700,000. Yeah. And now in today's terms, people were just like, oh, my God, that's, that's a terrible uh, high cell count. And it is. And I think going back in, in, in that time, if we look at where the origins of dry cow therapy came from, um, it actually started in the UK with their five-point plan and what that plan was around was back in the day um, you know a lot of herds were infected with a bug called strep ag and it's a bug that I've only ever actually seen twice in herds in New Zealand very very unusual I've never heard of it so you never heard of strep ag <laughs> so strep ag has pretty dire consequences like it it tends to be a lot of it's subclinical and it tends to cause like a really big drop in, in milk production and raise the overall cell count um, strep ubris also causes high cell counts, but strep ag is passed cow to cow like wildfire, so it tends to spread very quickly. And what was interesting was when we first came into this industry um, and they were talking about strep ag, I was like, that's really interesting because the, the industry I'm from, it's, it's, it's known to exist as well, but and they were talking about it being as, as an obligate pathogen of the udder and something associated with cows. But actually strep ag comes from, believe it or not, the genitals and anus of around 30% of the population. Okay. <laughs> so like we talked about before, like the, the transmission of things between cows and people is certainly yeah. possible. And if you think back to, um, you know, well, the 70s now, it's nearly 50 years ago. Yeah. Um, what were the hygiene conditions like? Some of these sheds in the UK are very, very old. Like we, We've seen them. There's not always places for people to practice adequate hygiene. And what we see is that, you know, we always make jokes about the English only having a bath once a week and that sort of thing. Strep ag, they did a study in the UK where they put it on people's hands. Yeah. And 10 days later, they could still recover it. Wow. So that's how, um, you know, 
you talk about things sticking around. So it just sticks in your hands. It, and it sticks grooves. in your hands. At, like So even if you do wash your hands after you wipe your bottom, like, yeah. you know, once you've got one cow with milk with strepag in it, cow to cow, that transmission is like wildfire. So what they did, um, they experimentally, if you get strepag in your herd, because it is so contagious, you need to treat the entire herd with antibiotics. Wow. So you can have, imagine have you the cost. Have seen that in New Zealand? Yeah, we, we have. It has from time to time happened, and it's very expensive. And we're not talking about a normal milk withholding because you've got the whole herd. Yeah. So you can imagine the cost involved in that. But back to you know what was happening in the UK, they found when they treated the whole herd with antibiotics, then magically the cell count was suddenly very low, and that's because of the, the strep responding very well to antibiotics. But what we're seeing today in herds is a completely different challenge, like the, the strep. Um, you know, antibiotics work very, very well against streps generally, but not so well against the staphylococci. So we're seeing, you know, as more staph aureus gets into herds and things like that, we're seeing more of that. Um, it doesn't tend to work so well. So there's a lot, a lot more that we know about prevention as well. So when we first started in the industry and we heard that people did this dry cow therapy, and we were like, what is this therapy? Yeah. You know, it's not rocket science. Like, why, why do you need to give all the cows antibiotics? It just didn't make sense to us. And what we learned is that farmers had a real sense of um, fear that if they didn't do that, something bad would happen. Yes. And I think now that, we, you know, we, regulations really coming behind this and lots of other countries around the world have really restricted the use of dry cow therapy and unnecessary use of antibiotics. Of course, if it's necessary, it needs to be used, but if it's not, it really doesn't. And I think looking at, um, you know, some of the things we've talked about today was prevention. Yeah. is really where we're at, like improving teat conditions so we don't have dirt and manure sticking. We'll build the cow's resilience against getting mastitis in the first place. And that's where the money is. Tell me, you did some work with a farmer in the Waikato that had some staff, and you identified those staff cows. He chose to dry cow those, and I think you retested them at the start of the year. Mm -hmm. What was the success rate like on those cows? Was it 50, 60 percent? I can't actually recall from the top of the top of my head, but it wasn't great. It's not, you know, 80, 100 percent. So there, there's definitely no panacea. Certainly in younger cows, it's more effective. Um, so cows in their first lactation seem to be respond better. Yeah. I'm not going to give a figure around that because I don't know the exact figure, but cows that are older, it's pretty much like it's not going to work. Yes. And so you need to be really realistic. Um, Scott McDougall, um, through Cognosco, produced a, an excellent app, which was funded by um, MPI's Sustainable Farming Fund, and that's got a calculator on there that you can calculate from the age of the cow, if you know she's got staph aureus, what her rate of success is likely to be with a dry cow. And I think it's important, like we talked about the pathogens earlier, to know that she has got staph aureus because that might also drive um, you know, vet advice into what the best dry cow for your particular condition is so that might not be universal across the herd it might be for some of the cows it depends on how much information you've got that app sounds really good what's the name of the app for anybody uh, listening? the app is called the bovine or bovine mastitis cure calculator and it's free for iphone and android on the app yeah. store and developed within new zealand developed in new zealand for new zealand cows new zealand conditions based on actual treatment and outcomes so it's, it's a great piece of work that was done and i think it's really helpful so, Natasha, we normally use somatic cell count as a guide to treat cows. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of farmers take the cutoff point of 150 cell count. Good guide? I think it's interesting. And, you know, when there were no tools to know what was going on, um, you know, somatic cell count testing is a, a simplified way of an overview of the herd. But I think um, it can be pretty dangerous to make conclusions because we know somatic cell counts not always linked to infection like sometimes it is and and in fact you could probably say most of the time it is but certainly there can be heifers with really bad pathogens like staph aureus that don't even register as anything significant in terms of cell count we've seen you know heifers with cell counts as low as 10,000 that are infected with staph aureus for why example. is that how can that happen if they're infected surely that that's triggering immune reaction. Yeah, well, Staph aureus, like they say about COVID, it's a tricky bug, and Staph aureus yeah. is also a tricky bug. Um, so in that context, it hasn't alerted the immune system to the fact that there's an infection. So the Staph aureus can actually live inside some of the immune cells of the cow. The cow's not aware that she has an infection. So why do we care? If, if the cow's got a low cell count, who cares, right? Yeah. And I've had you know this discussion with farmers. We have to care because we have to remember 
every day in that shed. If we milk one staff cow, she can, give an infectious dose six cows later, can be, can be found from, from the cluster. It doesn't mean that the next six cows will get staph. It doesn't mean that. But what it does mean is that they're, they're exposed to a dose that's potentially infectious. So if there's anything wrong with their teat condition, we're we talking now about the overmilking, things like that. So there's some cracks in the teat skin. You know, the cluster's been removed and, and a vacuum's not broken properly and we've inadvertently squirted milk back from that bowl of that cluster from several cows yeah. up the teat canal of that cow. We've got huge increases in risk. So every single thing that goes wrong, um, that cow can be like a sleeper and infect many cows on the herd. Because she herd tests low, her somatic cell counts low, we're not even considering her. Um, so I think it's not always um, somatic cell count You know, can, can be a bit tricky that way. The other thing we have to remember is if we start talking about selective dry cow, blanket dry cow, what we're going to do, if we take this limit of 150, which seems to be the limit where most people are comfortable that a cow's not infected, and statistically we can see that um, when she calves, there's like if we, you know, did selective dry cow under 150, that work's all been done. That there's no greater risk of her getting mastitis. You know, we, we're comfortable that she's not infected. But what we have to remember is that a, a somatic cell count test, a herd test, is actually a composite sample of all four quarters of that cow. So if you say 150, potentially you could have one quarter at 600. Yes. You know, let's say three quarters at zero, more or less, and, and one at 600. But what actually happens when you get mastitis is that quarter will be light. So it's not contributing as much to the sample. So actually that quarter could be even at a million. And straight away, there's an opportunity missed. So when you look at it in that manner, then RMT cows that dry off, what, for me it's a light bulb thing. Why do we stick antibiotic in those other three healthy quarters if we've only got the infection in one quarter? Is that where RMT would come in? Yeah, RMT is a, a great tool, and I, I can't I can't emphasise enough how this is a, a tool for farmers that virtually costs nothing. Yes, it, do, it does take some time. Knowing how to do it correctly is, is a huge caveat in all of this because if you're not doing it right, um, if you're fussy with RMT testing, you can see an individual quarter at 300, which would translate to an overall somatic cell count at 75. So you're mm. much finer tuning. So. Even if you if you are herd testing those cows that are 150 and under, it's probably worth RMTing. If you're not herd testing, an RMT is going to give you some fantastic information if you know how to do it correctly. So um, somatic cell counting might might seem like herd testing seems like an easy solution, but in fact there's a lot of work associated with that too. There's rubberware yeah. that's got to be changed over and morning and afternoon milking and samples collected and collated and cows scanned and it's a, it's a big job. So I'd suggest if we um, sort of come back to that idea of drying off a batch of cows, not trying to do the whole herd at once. If you, you know, the work that Scott McDougall did around RMT testing the cow before she's dried off um, told us that, yeah, we can definitely see that there's an infection there. His work uh, focused on if, if she responded to any quarter on RMT, they dried all four quarters off. Yeah. But subsequently some work's been done overseas in Canada where they, they only dried off the infected quarter with a dry cow and the other three they just... Teat seal. Yeah. And um, there was no penalty for doing that. So it, it did seem to be quite independent. So it did seem possible. Yes. But definitely, I think it's worth having a chat with the vet about what's right um, for but, you and, and um, making sure that, you know, you're up for the task. If you've got something in your herd, let's say you had strep ag in your herd, you would probably definitely want to do a blanket tri cow. Yeah, but, yeah. but that's not the reality for most farms these days. So most, most farms have not got that situation going on. So you know, with pathogens like strep uberus, we've got a really good handle on, you know, these things will react readily on RMT, if, even if there's a subclinical infection. I think there's a degree of fear in New Zealand, though. Like, we've got herds of people that sell counts under 100,000. They think that they're, they're fearful of not blanket dry cowing. I think this is going to be a psyche we're really going to have to break as we, you know, this, there is a global demand to use less antibiotic. Yeah, and I think, you know, first comes the... Um, you know, the idea that it's going to happen like they did with somatic cell counting. They said, okay, this is the direction we want to head in. And at some point there'll be some regulation behind it. I mean, as um, as you can imagine, like, I mean, nobody wants to use, the farmers least of all, unnecessary antibiotic. It's not just um, the cost of it. It's also the social wider picture. You know, these are the same antibiotics we're using for lots of other purposes in well, human medicine. And we we don't have many alternatives. So the longer we can have the use of them for, it does pay to, to use them carefully. 
I've certainly seen that in the medical industry. You know, they used to prescribe antibiotics. You know, I used to get sinus infections regularly. No longer do they give you antibiotics, bang off the cuff. <laughs> Back 10 years ago, they did. So it, it's already happened there, hasn't it? Yeah, and we know antibiotics can cause a lot of other problems as well. Like it's, um, you know, we, we're creating potentially resistance by overusing them. So that, that poses problems in our herds. Um, like, for example, in Holland, if you're a dairy farmer um, and you are admitted to a hospital, you are um, put into an isolation facility because they consider that you are infected with bacteria resistant antibiotics. Because you've because used so you're much. Because you've, you've, you've had used contact. so much. You've yeah. had contact with antibiotics. Yeah. And if, if you are um, a farmer in Holland, you're not allowed to visit a hospital. You're actually not allowed to be a visitor. Wow. Um, they're, they're that fearful that you'll bring something in. So, you know, when we've got, you know, th- these things didn't come from nowhere. This is not superstition. This is. You know, there, there'll be some scientific basis for that that they've found yeah. on farmers that they carry, you know. Um, well, I think it's in Holland that they've reduced the antibiotic usage markedly in the last 10 years. They're also seeing better responses when they do treat, treat a cow for that reason. Yeah, that's correct. Um, so, yeah, overall, uh, Holland's reduced their antibiotic use um, by 70%. So blanket mm. dry cow was the first one to go. And, and that was, uh, we're talking specifically dairy farming, not, you know, it was, it was across all agriculture. But for dairy farmers, they felt they weren't using very many. It was the chicken and the pig farmers that used all the <laughs> antibiotics. And, yeah. and people here would probably argue the same thing. But the government said, no, we want to see a 70% reduction and you've got to show to us. So when they, well, actually it started off at 50. When they got to 50, they said, that's fantastic. We want to see 70. So they've really... Um, I guess out of that regulation comes the innovation, right? It comes the the means. Like, how are we going to do this? We can't just suddenly stop using antibiotics and and expect great results. Like, it, it doesn't work like that. We have to have that information. Yeah. So that information, pathogens like the tools, RMT, um, you know, teat sealants, all those things. Where we're going to keep the cows? What you know? What's our stocking rate when we're drying them off? Like, you know, when we're going to restrict that feed and the they haven't got a whole lot. Are we putting too many cows into a paddock? Are we giving them a clean break? Those sort of things are really important around dry off time. And and the same with calving. Yeah. Like if we can sort of look look forward instead of trying to treat things that have already happened and look into that prevention mode, we're gonna um like completely surprise ourselves, I think, with what we can do. Oh, look, and I, I think it'll put the deer industry in New Zealand in a fantastic position if we reduce that antibody. It gives us a great marketing story. And I, and I know the dairy companies are driving it on cell count, but I personally believe antibiotics should be thrown in there as a, as a key measurement in that because it gives us a marketing advantage overseas with our product. Definitely. And I think we're, we're pretty blessed with our, our fresh air and sunshine. Our moderate climate is ideal for farming outdoors. And I think that gets us away from a lot of causes of mastitis. And like, I don't want to make it sound like farmers are doing a bad job because they're not. But could we improve? Could we be more efficient? I think definitely we could. And I think most farmers would understand um, the social consequences, um, you know, around using less antibiotics and how much that, that helps everybody, but also the economic impact for themselves. Like some farms spend a fortune on, you know, yeah. all kinds of antibiotics, whether it's for dry cow, whether it's for intramammary treatments. And, and to know that probably, you know, a good 50%, maybe even 70 in some cases can be prevented. It's, it's you know, it's a big carrot. Yeah, definitely.